Creating a database design for an e-commerce website is a great exercise to help you practice your skills. In this video, I'll show you a database design for an e-commerce website, the requirements it meets, and explain each of the tables and why they are designed in this way. There's a link to the diagram in the description, so you can download it for reference. Let's get into it. Welcome to the Database Star YouTube channel, the place for developers looking to improve their database and SQL skills. We're looking at a design of an e-commerce database because it can help you design your own database, whether it's a similar e-commerce system or another system. The aim is to help you understand how some of the concepts can be designed. Before we get into the design of the database, let's look at what we want to do first. What should the database be able to do? Here is a list of the things that I think an e-commerce database and website should be able to do. I've based this on a bit of research and a bit of experience with online shopping. I'll list these in the description as well, and we'll mention them as we go through the design. In summary, it includes functionality for creating accounts, contact details, multiple addresses and payment methods, products and product categories, product attributes, number of products in stock, shopping carts, shipping methods, order processing, user reviews, and product promotions. Let's have a look at the design. Here is the ERD or Entity Relationship Diagram of the e-commerce database. As I mentioned earlier, there's a link to an image of this in the description if you want your own copy. There are a lot of tables and relationships here. This might seem a bit overwhelming and confusing, but we'll go through each of the different areas and I'll explain what they are. Let's start with the site user table. This represents a user who can log into the website, which meets requirement number one. Users can create accounts and log into the website. We'll store an ID as the primary key, which is used to relate to several other tables. We'll store an email address, which is used for contacting the customer. This assumes that the user can also use their email address to log in, so we haven't added a username field. But if you want to, you can add a username field as well. We also add a phone number field to use for any communications if needed. This table will allow us to meet requirement number two. Finally, we have a password field here. Of course, this will be encrypted and not stored in plain text. Next, we have the address table. We also have an ID field as the primary key, which as you may see is a convention I've taken for most of the tables in this database. We have a range for other fields for an address. Unit number, street number, address line one and two, city, region, and postal code. We have a separate table for country, as there is a defined list of a couple hundred countries, and this is related to the address using the primary key and foreign key. For more details on why this approach is taken, check out my other video here on designing address fields. Requirement number three states that a user can have multiple addresses on their account and specify a default. So we have a joining table called user address. This assumes that an address can be applied to more than one user. There could be functionality in the website to allow an existing address to be related if, for example, two people in the same house place an order to the same address. This could prevent duplicate addresses in the table. So the user address table has a link to the user table and the address table. We also have an is default column, which will allow the user to specify which of their addresses are the default. This would be some kind of Boolean value and set for a single address. Next, we'll take a look at the payment methods. Requirement number four says users can add one or more payment methods to their account and can set a default payment method. We can achieve this by using this table here called user payment method. It has an ID as the primary key and a link to the user that sets up the payment method. It has a foreign key of payment type ID, which is linked to the payment type table. This table would include values such as credit card, PayPal, or other payment types we want to support. The provider field may be something like MasterCard or Visa or another company who provides the payment. Account number is the number used for payment, and an expiry date is added for the payment. Finally, we have an is default field to let the user specify that one of their payment methods is the default. There are a range of regulations that need to be followed if you want to store credit card information in the database. There may be other solutions for this, such as allowing another provider to process the credit card transactions so we don't need to store the credit card information. 
so this design could be updated if that's the approach we want to take. Let's move over to products. Requirement 5 and 6 are about storing products and that categories can belong to other categories. We have a product category table here, which contains an ID and a category name such as clothing or shoes. Categories can belong to other categories, and the way we've done this is having what's called a self-join. This means that a category has a foreign key to another category's ID record. This allows us to have a hierarchy of categories, and we don't need to create separate tables for category and subcategory. We can also have as many categories as we need. We aren't limited to just one or two. We've done this using the parent category ID field, which links to the ID field in the product category table. Let's look at the product table. This is one of the many tables that we've used to define the product, and these are arguably the most complex of the whole design. Let's go through them one by one. This product table defines what is shown on a list of products page. When you browse an online store, you'll see a range of products, probably with an image. A product, such as slim t-shirt, would only be shown once, even though it may come in a range of colours and sizes. In this table we have an ID and a link to the product category. We have a name and a description of the product. We also have a product image field, which would be where we store a link to an image to be shown on the list page. Here is an example of what could be shown in the product table. We've got a couple of products with names, descriptions and links to images. The table to the left is product item, but we'll come back to that as we need to look at a few other tables first. The next table we'll look at is called variation. This table allows us to specify what options can be changed on a product. For example, a product of slim t-shirt has different options for size and colour. In this variation table, we have an entry for size and an entry for colour. This table includes an ID and a link to the category table and the name of the variation, such as size or colour. We've linked it to the category table as we have assumed that the variation applies to the category. For example, the category of clothing could have size, colour and material. The category of mobile phone could have variations of colour, storage capacity and screen size. It would also allow us to define further details of sizes, as there may be separate sizes for men's t-shirts, women's pants or shoes. Here's an example of some data that would go into this table. We have some variations for one category which could be clothing, and another category which could be mobile phones. The next table is the one to the left, which we've called Variation Option. This will list all of the different possible values for each variation. For example, a size variation for clothing could contain values such as XS, S, M, L and XL. A colour variation option for phones could be black, white, grey and blue. There's a link to the variation table for each option, and an ID column and the value to use. Here is an example of what could go into this table. We have some records for different variations and different values. This design of options for products is similar to an entity attribute value design, which is where we have the attribute types listed in the variations and the values in this option table. This has the advantage of being quite flexible, but we lose the data quality checks you might get with dedicated tables and data types. For example, instead of storing shoe sizes in this table as values, which would be a text column, we may have had a shoe size table which is stored as numbers. I went with the approach of separate tables for each attribute in another video I created on product attributes, which you can see here. This is a different approach which may work better for a larger number of products. The next table is the one above, called Product Item. This is the instance of the product with all the different options. For example, if the product record is slim t-shirt, then this product item would be slim t-shirt in a colour of black and a size of M. For this combination of attributes, we have an SKU or stock keeping unit, which is a standard identifier in the e-commerce world. We also store the quantity that we have in stock which will let us meet requirement number 8, which is about keeping track of the number of products in stock. We have a product image field, which could be used if we want to show a different image on the product page for each attribute. For example, different colours of phones or t-shirts. Finally, we have the price field, which is the price for the product. The price may vary depending on the options. For t-shirts, they may all be the same price, 
but for phones, the price may vary depending on the options. So this product item record is the combination of all of the variation options. How do we specify which options apply? How do we know that the product item with an ID of 5 is in the colour black and a size of M? We do this by joining to the variation option table. However, a product item can have many variation options, such as a t-shirt having a colour of black and a size of M. A variation option can also have many product items. There can be more than one t-shirt with the size of M. So we have a many-to-many -many relationship and need a joining table in the middle. I've got another video here which goes into more detail on many-to-many -many relationships, so check that out if you want to know more. This joining table is called Product Configuration. This stores the combinations of the product item and variation option. It allows us to specify that each product item can have many different variation options. It will be used on the page that allows users to select the attributes, such as size or colour, and show the prices. Now that we've covered the product part, let's move on to the shopping cart feature. Requirement number 9 mentions that visitors can add one or more products to their shopping cart as part of their shopping experience. Shopping carts are not saved in a database unless they are logged in. This means that the shopping carts are related to users, and won't be guests or anonymous users. So we have a shopping cart table here which has an ID and a related user ID. The items in the shopping cart are stored in the shopping cart item table. This has an ID, a link to the shopping cart table as a cart ID, and a link to the product item that was added, and the quantity that is in the shopping cart. It's saved in the database to the user. Requirement number 10 is about specifying payment details and address as part of placing an order, so let's move on to that. We have a table here called Shop Order, which captures the order placed by the user. We've called it Shop Order rather than Order because Order is an SQL keyword and it could get confusing in our SQL scripts. This table has an ID, a link to the user ID that created the order, and an order date which captures the date and probably the time it was placed. We capture the payment method ID which was used, which is a link to the existing payment method table we covered earlier. We have a column called Shipping Address, which is a link to the address table we looked at earlier too. The next field is Shipping Method, which allows the user to specify things like Standard, Priority, Express, or whatever options are defined. These are stored in a separate table with the name of the method and the price. Requirement 11 mentions these can be selected, and each method has a single price. We have an Order Total field, which is a calculation of the product prices and the shipping method. We calculate this so we know how much an order came to, as prices for products could change in the future. Finally, we have an order status table and a field to link to it. This would store the statuses that an order can go through, such as ordered, processing and delivered. This design assumes that a shopping cart would be converted to a shop order, which could be done by the application. This means that the shopping cart table is separate to the shop order. We could use an alternative design where there was only one shop order table, which could represent the shopping cart by having empty values for things like order date and address, which I think could work as well. An order has many products, and these products are stored in a table called order line. This table includes an ID, a link to the product item that was ordered, and a link to the order that the order line belongs to. It also includes the quantity of the product that was ordered, and the price of the product when ordered because prices can change over time. This order and order line design is quite common in e-commerce databases. The next feature we'll look at is reviews. Requirement 13 states that a user should be able to leave a review for a product they have purchased, which includes a rating from 1 to 5 and a text comment. We've done this by adding a user review table here. This includes an ID as the primary key, a link to the user who left the review, and a link to the product that was included in an order. This is a link to the order line record, so we can allow reviews to be left for products that a user has ordered. We have a rating value which is the number from 1 to 5, and the comment is the text comment to be added for the review. The final requirement, number 14, is the ability for promotions or sales to be run which allows for one or more product categories to have a specific discount on their price. We have achieved this by adding the promotion table. This includes an ID, a name of the promotion, and a description if one needs to be added. 
we have a discount rate, which is the percentage of discount applied to products, such as 10% or 50%. We also have a start date and end date, which the website may want to display or communicate to customers. A promotion can have many categories, and a category can have many promotions, so we need a joining table to handle this many-to-many -many relationship. We've called this table Promotion Category, and it simply includes a link to the category and the promotion. So that's how we can meet this requirement for promotions and categories. So we've covered all the requirements in our database design. Here is the full design again, which you can get an image of using the link in the description. What's next? If you want to create the SQL for this to set up your own e-commerce database, check out my video here which is about creating an SQL database based on a database design. I don't have the SQL for this design specifically, but if I add it later it will be in the description. If you want to learn more about database design and SQL, visit my website at databasestar.com. If you like this video, consider subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching.